The following recording is a program of the World War I Historical Association. This special ongoing series commemorates the centennial of the First World War. This is Dana Lombardi. On September 20th, 2014, the Florida and Gulf Coast chapter of the World War I Historical Association held a seminar with the co-sponsorship of the Public Library of Foley, Alabama. Six noted scholars gave presentations under the theme 1914 Europe Goes to War. These presentations are presented here in six videos recorded at the event. gave me an hour and I'm going to take every precious minute. Of this <laughs> uh, but I will digress from some of my reading for some of the slides and I'll try that I, I deliberately have not made this too technical, but I do hope that you get a feel for what military medical care was, particularly the first six months of that uh, war. Okay. Uh, this talk will describe the development of the British Army Medical Services, I'll call it the BAMS, from the Second Anglo Boer War to the end of 1914. It argues that the BAMS underwent a series of pre war changes which enabled it to react quickly and with surprising flexibility to the desperate conditions of 1914. The responses parallel elements of Clausewitz's quotes, fascinating trinity, unquote, concerning the elements of war. The, the, they firstly established acceptable standards of medical care, secondly conformed to military strategy and tactics, and finally account for its actions and outcomes to government oversight. Although the Boer War is a convenient starting point, the 40-year period following the Crimean War had resulted in some basic reforms of the BAMS. The sanitary disaster early in the war, which was eventually corrected, and the annoying high-handedness of Florence Nightingale prompted a, prompted a flurry of post-war royal commissions and parliamentary inquiries. All told, there were six, along with an unsuccessful court-martial of the Director General of the BAMS, Sir Andrew Smith. The testimonies, however, resulted in the establishment of the Postgraduate Army Medical School, which was located at Fort Pitt and moved to Netley in 1862. The school's civilian and military teachers, while instructing physicians in military medicine, also encouraged medical officers, the MOs, to receive civil certificates in public health, ophthalmology, even ob and to contribute to fundamental progress in bacteriological research during the late 19th century. Major General David Bruce, seen on the left, discovered the organism responsible for Malta fever. On the upper right, Colonel William Boog Leishman developed, discovered Kala Azar, while Sir Ronald Ross at the bottom right eventually won the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the Anopheles mosquito as the vector for malaria while he was in the Indian Medical Services. Field medical care improved during the colonial wars with the introduction of evacuation in Ashland and the careers of MOs finally matured following the establishment of the Royal Army Medical Corps, the RAMC, which gave substantive rank and pay, substantive rank, pay, and purposes to all medical personnel in 1898. The personnel were still celebrating their new status and enlarged paychecks when the Boers declared war on the British Empire in November 1899. The conflict managed to put the BAMS on notice that whatever reform had occurred, it still wasn't enough to match contemporary military medical care. 
the RAMC had to conform to several phases of military operations. But basically, the line of evacuation went from columns of troops in the belt to 100-bed mobile field hospitals. From there, the casualties were transported to the railheads, then to the stationary hospitals along the railways, or 500-bed general hospitals at the bases. Hospital ships took the casualties back to England. The problem was that the stretcher bearer, bearers, wagons, or walking wounded at the front were separated by field hospitals by long distances, and their transport was not controlled by field hospitals, but by separate bearer corps. As the columns moved forward, the field hospitals, equipment, and personnel scattered over hundreds of miles. Poor communication resulted in uneven distribution of medical care. In a nutshell, the lines of evacuation in the field were not mutually supportable, and to make matters worse, nobody knew where they were. Due to inadequate bed space in field hospitals, casualties had to be transported or backhauled quickly to the railheads, usually by uncomfortable springless general service wagons. There was no coordination of care at the railheads, which were located at the front of the lines of communication, the LOC. So troops were simply loaded on and shipped down the line. However, once the casualties were on the railways, the medical care assumed the routine of larger hospitals. Oops. Yeah, okay. Assume the care of larger hospitals. Specially fitted hospital trains carried 92 casualties with 22 staff, while eventually there were over 100 stationary and general hospitals along the lines of communication and bases. There were, words and praise, uh, there were words of praise and honors for the medical staff. Six MOs were awarded the Victoria Cross. Many were mentioned in dispatches. Up and coming RAMC senior staff, such as Lieutenant Colonel Sir, Sir Alfred Keogh, seen in this image, made their reputations in South Africa. Keogh was 43 years old and a graduate of Queen's Medical School in Dublin. As CEO of the Third General Hospital in Cape Town, he ran an exemplary facility with strict attention to sanitary details. Fair-minded and quietly efficient, Keogh developed close ties to senior military and government officials. He would be appointed Director General of the BAMS in 1904. All this meant that even with the difficulties in field transport, the care of battle, battle casualties was good, although not exceptional. The Boers' Mauser rifles, rifles were regarded as humane weapons. Wounds were clean. Artillery did not play a dominant role in the prolonged operations. There was a mean ration strength of over 200,000 officers and other ranks. There were 25,000 battle casualties, 5,700 were killed in action, and 6.9% of the casualties admitted to hospitals died of wounds. But beneath this patina of professional competency, there were serious professional problems. First, the RAMC was considerably under strength. Contact, contract surgeons or local physicians, sometimes with questionable ability, filled over half the positions. And while the Dominions contributed more than their fair share of nursing sisters, seen this, in this image, nurse Minnie Affleck at the First Canadian Hospital, the British Army Nursing Service was shorthanded and control over local volunteers was tenuous at best. Second, the arrival of wealthy nobility and their privately funded hospitals became a source of irritation and confusion. Mrs. Richard Chamberlain, the sister-in-law of the colonial secretary, took it upon herself to act as an ad hoc inspector for medical care. When she threatened to publicly expose difficulties, Lord Roberts banned her from any, entering any military hospital. Sir Frederick Treves, a consultant surgeon during the war, wrote in the Times of London that there were two plagues in South Africa, one a plague of flies and the other a plague of women. <laughs> Third, the poor physical condition of the recruits later in the war resulted in a high rate of invalidism. The RAMC's rep reputation was also damaged indirectly by outbreaks of typhoid in Kitchener's concentration camps. In this image, the inmates at Springfontein throw snowballs at the British guards. 
The major problem was an old one, the lack of sanitary control, particularly at the front or in the besieged cities. There were almost 431,000 non-battle casualties. About one-fifth were due to endemic typhoid or dysentery. The case fatality rate for typhoid was almost 14%. Shortages of laboratory equipment, poor sanitary control in the field due, due in part to a lack of infrastructure, endemic disease, and disregard of sanitary discipline, either by the MOs or non-compliant line officers, and inevitably resulted in public and government outrage. The usual series of royal commissions and war office committees followed soon after the war. In December 1900, the new Secretary of State for War, Sir John Broderick, dismissed Director General James Jameson without military honors. Keogh became a member of Broderick's Committee on the Reorganization of the BAMS. A new series of appointments was created. For example, the Director of Medical Services, called the DMS, was responsible for an army. The Deputy Director of Medical Services, the DDMS, was responsible for a corps. The Assistant Director of Medical Services, responsible for a division, etc., etc. Although confusing, the change was rational and delineated specific responsibilities for each echelon of medical care. The head of the War Office Reconstitution Committee, Reginald Balio Brett, Lord Escher, seen in this image, had an unexpected but profound effect on the BAMS. Escher was a courtier in King Edward's court, deputy governor and constable of Windsor Castle, a proud militia officer with a barely used uniform, an inveterate gossip and a gentleman of unusual but necessarily discreet sexual inclinations. One wagon, one wagon the court said that Escher always behaved like a, quote, medicated tomcat. <laughs> For whatever reason, the committee removed the director general from the old War Office Council and placed the appointment under the adjutant general without a seat in the newly formed Army Council. This meant that the BAMS was no longer an independent director, a demotion which had serious repercussions during the next war. On the other hand, an Army Medical Advisory Board made up of military and civilian consultants was established along with Queen Alexandra's Imperial Nursing Service with its own advisory board at the War Office. In the middle of this brouhaha, another war broke out. Three hours before the declaration of war on the 8th of February, 1904, the Japanese Imperial Navy attacked the Russian Far East of Port Arthur. Within six months, there were over 100 correspondents and military, military medical and civilian observers from a dozen different nations. The medical lessons learned in the war were for the most part unoriginal, but as it turned out, entirely convincing for many of the observers. What they did not realize was that the Japanese played the, um, played the observers unmercifully. Oriental courtesy, good food, the occasional cocktail, and scripted praise for Western technical expertise masked the fact that the Japanese controlled the data and most of the observers' activities. Here, General Kiyoki and staff with a group of correspondents hammered up for the camera. The area of operations outlined the medical problems. The Japanese supplied and evacuated going south and east by a short railway trip and then by sea. The Russians supplied and evacuated by a two-track railway going north and west through Mukden and Harbin and extending 5,000 miles back to Moscow. Medical observers on both sides agreed on some issues. Medical care in the field and transport was similar for both armies and equally different, difficult. Chinese coolies, horses, stretchers, or two-wheel field carts carried the casualties to the nearest field hospital and then to the trains. There were, however, the observers also agreed that the Japanese hospital ships were first rate and their extensive Red Cross medical personnel and supplies the largest in the world at that time, were almost completely under military control, particularly at the home front. 
They noted approvingly that Japanese MOs had rank, authority, and control within the military tradition of respect. But the, quote, real triumph of Japan, unquote, was the sanitary discipline of its army, a discipline that had been sadly lacking during the Boer and Spanish-American Wars. Clean water, field laboratories, and absence of venereal disease, and strict personal hygiene, reinforced by the military code of Bushido, led to the accurate but misleading conclusion that for the first time, there were more battle casualties than non-battle casualties. The American and British observers with the Japanese condemned the Russians for their poor sanitation, high incidence of typhoid fever, and most importantly, a lack of military rank and authority for Russian MOs. There were, however, noticeable differences in the observers' reactions. The ones embedded in the Russian army admitted that the Japanese had better sanitary discipline but it appeared that those nasty Russians tolerated their own filth. There were a few outbreaks of typhoid, but these were controlled even with dirty fingers. The rations were more than adequate and generally accepted by the troops. Moreover, the 5,000 mile trip from Moscow to Harbin served to separate the sick and weak recruits from the rest of the conscripts on their way to the peninsula, so that the physical condition of the average Russian soldier was excellent. In addition, the Russians adapted well to their long LOs. <coughs> the field hospitals and bearer companies were combined into one organization under medical control. New units called evacuation hospitals were located at railheads in the front of the LOC, or the so-called neck of the bottle, to triage or treat casualties arriving from the combined field hospitals before railway transport. Various stationary hospitals were placed on the railway from the peninsula to Harbin, the advanced base. Multiple hospitals were organized at Harbin, including the first specialized military psychiatric hospital, the 50-bed Central Psychiatric Institute, seen in this image. Additional general hospitals were located on a long trip back to Moscow. The Russian military hospital trains were clean and reasonably comfortable while the independent trains organized by the Russian nobility or Red Cross were for all practical purposes impressive, mobile, well-equipped hospitals that could be stationed anywhere along the line. The large image shows the staff of Princess Vera, Vera Gordal, 200-bed train. The princess was an experienced surgeon who practiced in an OR in the train. In the upper right, the princess and Tsarina dress a wound. The senior British observer accepted the value of all the observations, but he was suspicious of the highly touted Japanese record. Colonel William Grant McPherson, a.k.a. Tiger Mac, was 47 years old, a graduate of Edinburgh University with graduate work at Tübingen and Leipzig in medicine, logic, and German. He had served in Gibraltar, edited the Gibraltar Chronicle, and in the North China Command. He supervised army sanitary changes after the Boer War, was liaison with the British Red Cross Society, the BRCS, and a member of the Army Medical Advisory Board. Physically and intellectually impressive, McPherson was meticulous and accurate with a healthy dose of skepticism. So what he did was not genius, but all he did was he took some of the statistics from the Japanese forces and compared to what happened in the Boer forces in uh, South Africa. Uh, from 1904 to 1905 and then South Africa 1899 to uh, uh, 1902. Let's see if I get it. Admissions for wounds, annual rate, see much higher than the Japanese. Deaths from wounds, annual uh, 1,000 per strength, 137 versus 14. Admissions for disease, less than the Boer War, but still pretty high. Deaths from disease, much higher in the Japanese. Admissions for typho typhoid, oh, I'm sorry, uh, much less than the Boer War, but the deaths were exactly the same. Percentage of deaths of the wounded, uh, McPherson in this report gave it as 11.2% and in the medical history in the 
1923, they gave it a 6.9 percent. And I think what, what McPherson was doing, he was taking the deaths from all wounds, and the 6.9 percent was the deaths from those who were admitted to the hospital. That's what made the difference. Percentage of the death in the sick were higher than the Japanese. Percentage of death from typhoid and dysentery higher. Killed the wounded, about the same. Admissions for wound disease, much uh, 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 higher in the Japanese. And there it is, deaths from wound disease is much higher in the Japanese than it was for the British. Well, uh, McPherson at the time said, well, you know, what this kind of shows me was, despite all the personal hygiene and Bushido and all the rest of it, the Japanese weren't that healthy. Uh, they still had a considerable amount of disease. Well, McPherson didn't know this problem. And uh, it wasn't, it didn't surface, and maybe in the Japanese records of the war, but I, I, yeah, I can't find him in any of the observers. And this is a disease called beriberi, the J Japanese called it khaki. On the left is dry beriberi, and on the right is white beriberi. And it's a thiamine deficiency disease, which was not known at that time. Uh, they thought it was an infection. And uh, it can cause a peripheral neuropathy, which you see on the left with skinny legs, and an encephalopathy, Korsakoff and Wernicke syndrome. And on the right, it affects the heart. They get congestive heart failure and swelling of the uh, lower extremities. Uh, well, uh, it was this man who was uh, uh, kind of important. This is uh, Takaki Kinehiro. Uh, and uh, Baron Takaki, as he later was, uh, was a um, uh, medical student in Japan under Thomas Willis. And then he went to St. Thomas in London to study and came back and joined the Navy. And in 1881, uh, he noticed that the incidence of beriberi in the, the Navy was kind of high. As a matter of fact, there was a nine-month uh, tour of the Pacific uh, in, a, like, uh, in a cruiser. Uh, and uh, there were a crew of 340 and half got beriberi, and uh, uh, about 20% of the crew died. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, this something's wrong here. So there was another cruise, exactly the same, same group. And what he said was, well, it could be infection, so we'll isolate the people with beriberi. And you know, all they do is eat rice, white rice. Let's give them some, uh, you know, the damn soup, the miso soup or whatever it is, and, and soybeans and uh, barley along with them. Well, by the time they came back, they had 14 cases of beriberi and about two or three deaths. Since that time, that was about 1881, up until the Russian-Japanese War, the Navy supplemented all of it. They didn't know why. They still thought it might be infection. Who knows a nutrient problem? But uh, they kept supplementing it. The Army did not. And the difference is, if you look in the lower right, on the right is brown rice, and on the left is polished white rice. And the Japanese troops just wouldn't eat polished uh, or wouldn't eat brown rice. And brown rice has all the thiamine, the brown coating. And when you polish it, you get rid of the brown coating and you get rid of the thiamine. Now the difficulty was that uh, uh, they could have survived it or uh, avoided it by giving supplemental food. And as a matter of fact, before the war, several divisions did do it when they could buy the food. But the supplemental food was more expensive and it just was not feasible. So throughout the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese troops predominantly fed, which they loved, polished rice. And consequently, there seemed to have been a problem. As I said, the observers, there were only two observers that said anything about beriberi. One was with the Japanese, and he said, geez, there does seem to be a lot of beriberi here. And the other one was with the Russians, and he said, you know, I heard there was a lot of beriberi. No data, nothing else, just there. Well, Baron Takaki went back to St. Thomas in, in London and gave a, a series of talks. In 1907, he had retired. Uh, he was the sur uh, retired as a surgeon general of the Imperial Japanese Navy. But what he did was he gave the talk on the Army. He didn't talk about the Navy, and I thought that was kind of unusual. You know? uh, I don't know why that occurred. But anyway, he gave the usual fi figures in his talk. 
and there's the battle casualties, and Russian, Japanese, and it's uh, better with the Japanese battle deaths, better with the Japanese non-battle deaths. Uh, no, wait a minute. Uh, ratio of non-battle to battle, eh, about the same. Typhoid casualties, only 1,041, 10,000, a little higher than the Japanese, but 4,000 in the Japanese. Well, forget the Japanese, because the Japanese made typhoid a strict diagnosis. They had a blood test. So these were absolute typhoid fevers. And the, the mortality was probably higher, because typhoid was, uh, they, they did not include dysentery. The Russians probably include dysentery with that thing. That's why it less died. But then all of a sudden, in one of the charts, that showed up on the bottom. And they had 97, to almost 98,000 casualties from Berry Berry, with a death rate of 3,950. Only time I could find it. No, nowhere else. Nobody else had this thing. It was in the Journal of the Royal Army Medical Corps and in Chicago. And that explains a lot of the problem. The moral of the story was that most observers saw what they were prepared to see or what the Boer and Spanish-American Wars taught them to see. Strict Japanese sanitary discipline controlled by MOs with appropriate rank and authority led to a low disease rate. Little wonder that the Japanese were victorious. But the Japanese never triumphed over disease. Their battle to non-battle ratio was high, not because the rel not because of a relatively low non-battle casualty denominator, but of a relatively high battle casualty numerator. What most observers did not see, what was hidden, or worse yet, what they saw but did not appreciate, were the effects of poor tactical leadership on battle casualties, the shattering infected wounds by artillery uh, or grenade fragments, the importance of nutrition, the high incidence of psychiatric casualties in the Russian amalgamation of the field hospitals, their new evacuation hospitals at the railheads, and medical care along an extended line of communication. McPherson, however, used some of these lessons learned in the years following the Treaty of Portsmouth. The old British field hospital was reorganized into a field ambulance, I'll call it the FA, which could be divided into three sections, each with a 50-bed capacity with both bearer and tent subdivisions. There were three FAs for each division. Any split in the FA was controlled by the ADMS of the division. A new 200-bed mobile clearing hospital was established, one for each division to be located at the neck of the bottle and controlled by the DDMS of the LOC. So you're getting used to the... To the thing. <laughs> McPherson organized, uh, McPherson organized sanitary squads for each battalion and larger sanitary sections for units along the LOC in bases. An Army School of Sanitation was established at Aldershot. Line officers were made responsible for the sanitary conditions of their commands. Men would collect and transport casualties while women would serve in rest stations and auxiliary hospitals. However, issues of registration, certification, control, and finances were disputed between the BRCS and the St. John Ambulance Association. And Keel, who was appointed BRCS after, head of the BRCS after his retirement, was unable to coordinate arrangements before the war. The BAMS also managed to keep pace with medical developments. The old Army Medical School was transferred to Millbank, which was close to the civilian medical schools in London. It, mer it merged with the Queen Alexandra's military hospital, seen in this image, to form the Royal Army Medical College. Pathologists and bacteriological labs were appointed at all large hospitals. Alan Roth Wright, seen on the left image, an eccentric professor at the Army Medical School, developed a heat kill vaccine for typhoid fever. He conducted several small clinical trials on troops during the Boer War and in India. Major General Bruce, which was head of pathology at that time, and who usually disliked everyone, including Wright, rejected the data. In 1909, Major Frederick Russell, seen in the lower right image, in the American Army Medical Department, adapted the vaccine 
which the American Army introduced in 1911. By 1914, the vaccine was recommended but not mandatory for the British Army. The reorganization in the early years of the 20th century was incomplete, but it indicated a willingness and a flexibility to adjust to the new realities surrounding the medical profession, the military, and the government. The BAMS was ready to face a continental war when on the 4th of August, 1914, RAMC personnel received telegrams with one short word, mobilize. They had, of course, no idea of what they were about to face. Even with historical revisionism, the initial war enthusiasm was real enough for the BAMS. Within two weeks, there were 70,000 bad volunteers swamping the hospitals, camps, and offices in Britain. The formation of entire hospitals by the BRCS, or wealthy nobility, just, in, just as in the Boer War, was added to the confusion. They were never placed under military control. Keogh was sent to France as head of the overseas BRCS. Emma Maud McCarthy, later dame, was appointed head of the nursing service in France. Strict but fair, she was a force to be reckoned with. God help the RAMC major that hassled one of her nursing sisters. She was the only senior medical administrator who lasted until the armistice. Major General Sir Tom Woodhouse was appointed DMS of the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF. The appointment was one of seniority rather than ability. Hmm. Lieutenant General Sir Arthur T. Slagan, a.k.a. Naughty Arthur, <laughs> became the new Director General of the BAMS. A veteran of the Sudan campaign where he was seriously wounded in the Boer War, he had received multiple awards for bravery during his career. He was made DG AMS on June 1st. By the end of August, he was hospitalized, some said for exhaustion, but returned in October. Slaga was not known for his clinical acumen, but he was an engaging personality and a reasonable administrator who protected his MO's backs throughout the war. McPherson became acting DDG AMS in his absence. Okay, now this is going to take a little while. These are some maps from the official history. This is a period of concentration. The mobilization was excellent. They mobilized well. If they could do anything, they could mobilize well. So they uh, cross over, and this is August 21st, a couple of days before the real battle. Next day they had some skirmishes. This is the area of concentration right, right here. Uh, when all is said and done, uh, Maubige was the uh, area here. This was the Cavalry Division, the uh, 3rd Division, 5th Division, and 1st and 2nd Divisions here. There. Uh, then a bunch of uh, field ambulances back here. Uh, Amiens was the advance base, Rouen and Le Havre were the uh, bases, and Boulogne was a base, but not a big one. Uh, Paris is down here. It's about 50 miles, 55 from Amiens to Lake Cateau, and another 40 from Lake Cateau to Mons. Notice uh, uh, Bethune, uh, Haysbrook, Saint-Omer, Ypres, all up in here. <clears throat> Probably the one, not the biggest problem, eh, the biggest problem. This was a scheme for, for the line of evacuation when uh, at, at the first concentration. And what they did was, obviously, railroads are key to evacuating. In the concentration area, there would be field ambulances and dressing stations, and they would evacuate uh, walking wounded or whatever by stretchers to refilling posts. And these were really supply dumps. And still uh, by ambulance wagons or supply cow mores, they back all them to railheads, the supply railway for this. And these were covered by British regional transport officers. All the railways went in through two levels of uh, uh, French control. The first which we won't talk about. This is the one, this is to control the embarkation of the troops going forward. 
but this was the advance base at Amiens. And this, all the trains that ran through from that one particular se sector ran through Amiens. Uh, from Amiens, they drop off the lightly wounded and then take the seriously wounded to Havre or Rouen. All these trains ran through. There were 20 trains a day from Boulogne and a total of 40 trains from both Havre and Rouen together. So it's just 60 trains a day, right? Well, this looks good on paper, but there was one particular problem. The French controlled everything. The British controlled nothing. So this area of regulation, if we take an example, was controlled by a French military <coughs> officer and a civilian employee. So if the British wanted to move anything on a train, they had to work through two levels at that regulation center, which was a military officer and a civilian employee who worked through them. Now, if you think about it, there are four um, elements in this particular uh, area. One is the French troops and material, and then the French medical care and evacuation. The next is British troops and material, and British medical and evacuation. Take a guess which one was low man on that particular totem pole when you only have 60 trains, and that was the British medical evacuation. Um, uh, the French controlled everything. The British had not planned for that control, and they did not have good control at the beginning of in fact, they didn't really get control till uh, the end of 1915, 15, 15, something like that. So that made it more difficult. There were other difficulties too. Hospital trains for the battle casualties were critical to evacuation, but they were not standardized and mostly jury rigged in the war. The British used French good wagons, good goods wagons and they were converted using British equipment and French uh, Peugeot frames. They didn't have enough stretch stretchers. There were only three partially refit uh, refitted trains available by the Battle of Mons, and uh, these were still incompletely fitted. Stretchers had to be taken from other hospitals. They didn't have them enough. Doorways had to be enlarged, and the loading platforms had to be changed because they were at a different level. All these things had to be done before the ambulances could go on. Also, by the time of embarkation, for, uh, for the French walking wounded and sick, or for the British walking wounded and sick, the French informed the British that they had no third class carriages for their transport. So they were to use partially converted goods wagons, but these would be the old 40 and 8. <laughs> so the walking wounded and the sick Got, or battle casualties too, got old 40 and eights and the French would partially convert. And any time the Frenchman said <laughs> partially convert, it could mean anything from new stre stretchers to a bunch of straw put in after the cabin was mucked out. Uh, so it caused considerable problems. Well, let's get back to the concentration. They required 850 medical officers, 529 nursing sisters, and 9,000 other ranks. Right. They got the nursing sisters. Uh, they had enough. Uh, uh, McCarthy, Maud McCarthy was at Rouen, and she stayed at Rouen for a long period of time before she went to headquarters. The 850 medical officers they got by hook or by crook because they were shorthanded in England. They didn't have enough to, 850 was just beyond what they could handle. So in England they started hiring uh, what they called a la suite officers, which I can't, I can't tell what they were. I don't think anybody knew what they were. They were probably daily contracts. The guy would come in a day and then leave and come back a couple of days later and get paid. This was clearly only a temporary fit, but it wasn't good. And in France, they'd have to use whatever territorials volunteered, uh, or if they could get volunteers uh, from uh, local physicians. Uh, so they had a catch and catch can. And the 9,000 ranks were filled up uh, mostly by volunteers from uh, companies and regiments. Uh, needless to say, these were a lot of times not the old thing. More problems. Woodhouse, the DMS of the BF, BF, was at Amiens. And he stayed, as far as I can tell, at Amiens throughout that half a year. He never left Amiens. Well, I mean, that's good. Amiens is a regulation center for the trains, but it isn't headquarters. 
headquarters was at La Havre, and then went to Le Cateau, and then moved. He was not there. So the DMS of the Med Medical Corps was not in close touch with the uh, uh, headquarters, and it made it very, very difficult. Uh, the war office uh, uh, telephoned or uh, telegraphed uh, Woodhouse and said that you need any more units, and he and Woodhouse telegraphed back and said, no, no, we have plenty, everything's in control there. That would obviously come back to how Woodhouse. There were no physicians at headquarters except for one who was a pathologist, who we will uh, learn to uh, learn to to love. His name was uh, Sidney Cummings, and he was a very good pathologist. But he was a pathologist, and I, I guess he was there to take care of the uh, uh, the army at headquarters. Well, as it turns out, during the concentration period and early in the battle, the Commanding officer of the First Corps, uh, General Haig, developed constipation. And there's nothing worse than a constipated general in the middle of <laughs> So Dr. Cummings, figuring that he's a general and is probably full of it anyway, <laughs> doubled the dose, even a huge dose. And he incapacitated Hank for a couple of days. I don't know. That's one of the tales. Finally, the third one was, uh, as we shall see, uh, the first corps, Hank's corps, never had a DDMS. Uh, they never had a corps surgeon. So Woodhouse had to work through the ADMS for each division. And that just meant more communication. Um, okay. Other problems, there was only one field, uh, field ambulance for each division in the field. The rest were in the back, as I said, back here. And they were still going forward when the, when the fight started. Uh, the transport from the dressing stations to the field ambulance to the supply depots had not been worked out. They were still uh, uh, concentrating in that area. There were no advanced medical depots, supplies, medical supplies, and half the hospitals were not there and would not be there until uh, September 1st. The French were in charge of the sanitation at the bases, not the British. Uh, it would take the British some time to get their act together for that. Uh, and needless to say, the British were very troubled uh, with an obsessive compulsive sanitary officer. Uh, they, they, anticipated problems or afraid of typhoid outbreaks, etc. Uh, believe it or not, there were no arrangements for sick uh, beyond Amiens. They had no arrangements at the bases yet for uh, uh, housing sick person, uh, non battle casualties uh, uh, or medical personnel to take care of them. And finally, they didn't have enough supplies. They had to go shopping in Amiens for uh, bedpans and things like that because they hadn't had enough. Oh, and there was one other thing, and whenever you see a photo like this, it's a kind of a famous photo of mobilization. Uh, each trooper's kit weighed 72 pounds with the rifle, and they were wearing wool. If you see the, this gentleman here, he's starting to sweat as it is, man. He's, yeah. this, is, this was tough. August in France, 72 pounds in a woolen. That's yeah. It's rugged. All right. Now let's. I I I don't want to mainly because I can't get into the real marches and everything. But but in point of fact was there were two uh, lines of evacuation. One in the first corps here, and one in the second corps. And this is Mons, and then here's Lake Lake Hato. So from the operations from the 23rd to 28th. If the system broke down immediately. And if you think about it, when they start to retreat, well, first of all, the, uh, the field ambulance was split up and went in various directions. But if you don't have communication, you soon, you soon lose where they're at and what they have in them. Secondly, what are you going to do with wounded? Well, the first thing you do is you send them back. Okay? But if things become confused, or there's too many wounded, then you plug up in the field ambulances. And so you're stuck. 
either leave them there or carry them on your back, which is in essence what they did. They left a lot of troops there. When you leave a lot of troops, you leave them with the medical officers, which they did at that time. They still do. So what is happening with this is that the field ambulances are spreading all along here. The railhead is at, uh, uh, where's San Quentin? Right here. This is the major railhead. They tried to establish a railhead at Valencia, uh, Valencia uh, but it didn't work. So the major railhead's down here. So they're marching down, but they're spread out, and now they've got to backhaul uh, casualties, uh, uh, avoiding the Germans, and uh, uh, things become very, very confused. Uh, the refilling points stopped. Uh, the supply, the railheads would have the supplies. They would try to go to the refilling points with the supplies. Never found them. They were gone. So they left the supplies on the roads. So the field ambulances were out of supplies. Uh, the 4th Division, here became a separate column after Lake Hateau, and they needed, a, 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 it was just another division to administrate, so they needed to set up the administration during the retreat for another line of evacuation, another column. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, probably the biggest thing was there are no war diaries. From Mons and Lake, Lake Hato, there's no war diaries for the regiments. They had none. Because they, they weren't filling out uh, uh, casualty forms. Uh, so consequently, the data you get, both in the official history and the official medical history, the official medical history is very, very, uh, we'll see what they have. Look, we don't know. We've only got data from certain uh, field ambulances from certain periods, and we got none. There's no data here. You know, we don't know, uh, which is very important. And finally, one thing that people don't realize is that this cylinder of retreat from here to here. Remember that the uh, Third German Army is here, the French Fifth Army is here. They they have their problems. All right, the French. You can't blame the French. They're 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 getting a hundred thousand casualties a month. Okay. The Russians are getting 300,000 casualties. So the British are still s important, but still small potatoes for the French. This column is about 20 miles, and this cylinder is about 20 miles in diameter, 25 miles in diameter. You got maybe 80,000 British troops, maybe 100,000 German troops, and thousands of refugees crawling into that cylinder. It was packed, there was no room. Uh, just, you know, more confusion. Oh, it gets worse. Many, in many instances, and the, the official history is very, uh, they said the only good thing about the retreat war, the French population w took in a lot of the wounded Brits. And before the con area concentration, they had kind of planned that maybe the French Red Cross and British uh, uh, adjacent British uh, uh, field ambulances could be able to handle the overload, which they did. The trouble was they didn't figure, how do you keep track of them? So they lost track of the men that they left with the French. There was no way they could uh, follow with this, follow up with this. By uh, the end of Lake Cateau, there were 470 one officers and 14,000 other ranks, 28th of August. 3180 killed or died of wounds. Now that's higher than the official histories, or many histories. And once again, uh, uh, the official history said this is only from Second Corps, we are only from First Corps. Half of Second Corps is not here. So this is a low number as far as the official medical history is concerned. It was written in 23. Uh, Okay. From the 28th of August to the 3rd of September, the uh, RAMC lost 34 medical officers and 590 other ranks, or about 4% and 7.5% of strength, just in this period of time. We don't know how many were lost before the 28th of August, but from this uh, six day, seven day period, they lost uh, that amount. Uh, 
could see. The, the uh, headquarters was set up at Melon, and now you have three columns marching back across the Rhine. Uh, uh, it's still in a disorganized fashion. Remember that the railheads, there's about five uh, army trains now. The railheads are still up here at San Quentin. And if you notice, the lines of communication were this way. This is where they evacuated. But they'd be going in a different way. They're at 90 degrees to the lines of communication. Now that is a military bad thing and a military medical disaster. There's no, you know, you're marching away from your lines of communication. And the trains couldn't get there. Number one, they didn't know where the uh, railheads were, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they're marching east of Paris toward Melun. This is the end. They changed their lines of communication, so that now they are evacuating east of Paris, through Paris, through Le Mans, down to Nantes and San Nazaire, about 300 miles by railway. So it's entirely different lines of communication. So you have lines of communication up north that patients are still going through to get to Amiens, and they're still, but there's no more hospital ships because they're going around to the Atlantic port, so they have to evacuate them by cross-channel boats. They have to establish sanitation at those two ports, and the French are in charge, and they're, they're worried about that. They now have casually scattered up north of Paris, down west for another 300 miles, and a variety of different institutions, if you see in the, the, the one in the upper right, or the one in the upper center, is a hospital in Paris. And there are a variety of um, hospitals that they don't have any control of with British casualties all through that thing. One other thing. Um, Lord Escher is uh, smiling over this whole thing. A at the time, what you you got to understand is that the medical services no longer were independent. Any additional personnel, they had to go through the adjutant general. Any any uh, quartermaster, any supplies, they had to go through a quartermaster, either a quartermaster at headquarters or a quartermaster. It was an extra level of what they had to, to go through, and it made things extremely difficult. Volunteer medical units started arriving at the channel ports. Uh, Woodhouse, at that, this time, and it's pretty messy, Woodhouse says, get them out of here. He, they, they come in, he sends them home. No room, don't know where to put them. Uh, so the, the nobility get a little mad, as nobility will do, and they, buy more? Oh no, ooh, really? Yes. <laughs> uh, oh my. Can we go on for a little bit more? Or is, or, no. I, 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 I don't want to be rude to this. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Um, but anyway, um, the situation, I'll have to stop here. Maybe we can go on later. Uh, uh, this, uh, Woodhouse sends people back to England, particularly uh, noble, nobles with their hospitals, but they ign some ignore them and start going towards Paris and stay all in that northwest uh, area. Um, uh, and uh, word gets out that Woodhouse is just uh, out of out of touch. Um, and finally, the RMC had to send more troops south to Marseille because the Indian Corps was coming in, and they had to establish uh, uh, troops for them. Um, boy, I didn't think it was that long. Uh, I'll go one more. Then I'll stop. Uh, Conditions were critical for the RMC when the BEF was ordered to advance to the north while trying to recover and refit from the retreat. General French was already making plans to evacuate the BEF. The punishment was severe during the advance. Another 47 RAMC officers and 386 other ranks were battle casualties, but the medical services started to function according to plan. FAs leapfrogged over each other during the advance Casualties were transported by stretcher and wagon to the FAs and then to mobile clearing hospitals near railheads. Casualty rail cars were still jerry-rigged, but the accommodations improved, at least close to um, 
uh, uh, at least close to Paris. Dr. Valadier was a uh, uh, American natural, a naturalized American, was working in Paris uh, and had his own uh, Rolls Royce fitted up with a dental car when he joined the British uh, BRCS. Uh, he came to treat Haig. Haig didn't like him, so Cummings had to call in for a British dentist. And by the end of December, there were 20 dentists with the first time the dentists were in the field. Uh, Valadier was a good time guy, liked a shiny uniform, independently wealthy, and he got along well with Slaggett. So Slaggett uh, gave him a, a part of number 53 General Hospital in Zemo. And uh, he stayed there for four years, opened up the first jaw and uh, dental unit in, and stayed there for four years. He was a dentist, so he had to have a medical doctor work with him when he practiced. Uh, some of the plastic surgeons were mad at him because he was a dentist. Uh, one of his Harold Gillies uh, didn't think much of him. But uh, Vladdy, two years after the war, was the only uh, one of two bright, uh, dentists that were knighted. Uh, became a companion of uh, the Cross of St. George and St. Michael, and uh, became a commander in the Legion of Honor. Uh, an interesting guy. Died penniless. Uh, he liked to gamble uh, after 10 years. Okay. Thank you very much.